to my fellow members of the class of 2019. We assemble here today on the ancestral and occupied homelands of the Quinnipiac people to commemorate our personal contributions to movements and histories so much bigger than us. Our personal contributions to legacies of care for our non-human friends and biospheric partners, to an ongoing struggle for environmental justice in indigenous communities and communities of color, to political fights to transform institutions of governance, law, and commerce with an eye to maintaining life as we know it. These are monumental struggles, monumental histories. And about 250 feet to my left, we can catch a glimpse of these trajectories in Sage Hall, where photos from every graduating class of the Yale School of Forestry dating back to 1904 hang. These photos document not only the evolution of our school, but also much broader trajectories of change. The first photo features only a handful of white men in suits and ties. But over the first decades of the 20th century, as these mostly white male cohorts grew, the photos regularly featured Filipino students, the first non-white members of our community. And in fact, in 1921, the majority of Yale forestry graduates were people of color. But the school grew more homogenous in the subsequent decades, as aptly illustrated in 1946, when the school had not one, but two class photos, one of which was for a special cohort of students from China who were only admitted due to the wartime effort against Japan, and the other consisting entirely of white men, a snapshot of a backward step in a much broader trajectory of change. A few years later, dogs begin to appear in the photos followed by one or two black faces, and then finally women. And with time, the suits and ties disappear, replaced with lettered sweatshirts and informal wear. The photos change from black and white to color, but old histories die hard. And in the 80s, we see a resurgence of the suits and ties, only to make way for FES swag. As cultural liberal norms and exploitative neoliberal markets transform the very fabric of our being. And then comes 2018, when a group of courageous students unfurled a banner just as the annual photograph was being taken. A banner, de a banner demanding the dismantlement of white supremacy in the environmental movement. Several of you, several of you continued this valiant effort in this year's photo. But while the students who courageously took a stand against white supremacy last year were chastised and rebuked by some, this year, the banner was a predetermined part of the proceedings, allowed by the administration with qualifications, evidence of incremental change, of growth, of our commitment to building something better together, even if the struggle for a representative environmental movement in our school is, as this year's banner points out, nowhere near complete. From all these points, we begin to see an uneven yet clear and promising trajectory the growth of an inclusive, intersectional environmentalism that recognizes that this nebulous thing we call the environment is not in fact distinct from the social institutions in which we inhere. <laughs> While we know our school and our movements are by no means perfect, no means at all, when we see this myopic snapshot of our work, we can't help but note something loosely akin to what Martin Luther King called the arc of the moral universe. An arc that includes struggles and setbacks and disappointments, but that nonetheless points resoundingly in the right direction. Yet when we consider the world that we, class of 2019, are now responsible for humbly and equitably stewarding, it becomes far more difficult to find that trajectory, that arc of the moral universe. Everywhere around us, we cannot help but confront troubling and violent degeneration, from the ongoing water crisis in black communities in Flint, Michigan, to the crippling financial debt of Puerto Rico that Yale is invested in, amplifying the economic shocks of climate change, to the dismantlement and petrification of the EPA and the Department of the Interior, to the underestimated acceleration of ocean acidification, to the imminent drilling in the Alaska refuge, to the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, to the rollback of environmental regulations, to the president mindlessly miming coal mining as though it's tantamount to shoveling snow. The political realities we are confronting display no signs of a forward-moving trajectory, no semblance of a moral arc. 
These are troubling times for our fellow citizens in Puerto Rico and in Flint and for climate refugees being detained at the border. These are troubling times for phytoplankton and bees and orangutans, troubling times for biodiversity and the diversity of voices excluded from the upper echelons of power. These are troubling times indeed. Perhaps, perhaps then, class of 2019, our task is not to extend the arc of the moral universe, is not to hope to build on the progress of the past in a linear trajectory. Perhaps instead, our task is to embrace the inevitability and ongoingness of struggle, to commit ourselves wholeheartedly to the work of stewardship and care, not so we can win or triumph or fulfill our destiny, but because the moral stakes of this moment demand nothing less than our greatest effort. When we struggle, regardless of outcome, when we give ourselves to something bigger than us, even if that something is elusive, even if the path isn't always clear and failure a very real possibility, we can do more explicitly what all of us have been doing all along, supporting fragile ecosystems, even when their futures look bleak facilitating energy transitions, even as fossil fuel extractions continue to grow, struggling for climate justice in communities that have never been more expendable in the eyes of our leaders, embracing silviculture and agroecology even as more land gets converted to monocropping and factory farming every year. In the process, we make space for the emotional turmoil that necessarily accompanies the momentous transitions we are embarking on. Class of 2019, we are entitled to our hope and our despair, to that sinking feeling that the world is going to shit, and that unflinching sensibility that we can make a better tomorrow. We don't need to choose sides between a linear utopianism and the dogged realities we're facing. As our class photos and hopefully our faculty grow more diverse, more representative of who we are as a society, and as 21st century capital, anthropocentrism, misogyny, and white supremacy continue to ravage everything we hold close to our hearts, we know the future that we're inheriting is unclear and uncertain, but that our moral resolve is unequivocally essential. Because for the past few years, we have struggled for what we believe in, even when the political momentum rendered many of our efforts moot. And this fight is the only thing we can know for sure as we endeavor to make the world that, deep down in our hearts, we know is certainly not likely, but just as certainly possible. Thank you.